Preoso, and welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast Freeform Edition, Episode 3. And as I record, I will say, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about politics, but we're going to talk about it in a very careful manner, one that doesn't pick particular sides or takes a particular viewpoint. I, I don't want you guys to think that I'm, I'm trying to do that. That is in no way the, the point of this episode. But I wanted to talk a little bit about my own experience in, in the UK and especially in Wales around this and kind of what I see as being things that I found peculiar in one instance, interesting in another from the standpoint of someone who's been involved in election campaigning in the past and uh, also kind of talking about why I think it's it's a fascinating thing to watch the British election campaigns and the Welsh Senith campaigns and kind of how those things affect me as a non-citizen living in the country and how they still do as someone who follows it as an interest point even today. So let's start off by saying that I am filming this before the election actually has been run. Uh, the campaign is underway. The election is very soon. By the time this publishes, I hope we'll know who won. I think it'll be rather obvious based on all the polling. But, and initially I wanted to publish this before the campaigning was over, simply because I wanted to kind of reach out to people who live in the UK who are Commonwealth citizens to kind of explain a few things to them in case they don't know. Because certainly when I went to the United Kingdom, I didn't know any of this. And I think it was very educational for me to learn some of the things I ended up learning. And I think it will be very interesting to sort of experience. So to kind of start from the start, if you live in a Commonwealth country and you move to the United Kingdom for any reason, uh, for a semi-permanent or at least a long-term stay, be it for work or whatever, the biggest difference you have versus somewhere else is you have the ability to vote in elections. Uh, in fact, you have the right to vote in any of the elections that are done, be it for council, be it for the Senate, be it for the national government. You can vote in all of those elections. That was probably the biggest surprise I had when I moved there. And the very first chance I got to do that was in the 2001 national election. And... I, I'm not going to lie, I found it very odd um, because in Canada, as in the United States and many other places, the, I, I, you can't vote in my country, so why am I allowed to vote in yours was certainly the thought process I had. But since I lived there, since I paid taxes there, and since it, it actually mattered to me, I did actually get involved in the elections. Um, one, I got involved because I wanted to know who I would vote for because I didn't have a clue. I didn't know the parties very well. I only really knew um, at the time Tony Blair was the prime minister, so I knew him. Uh, I didn't know the conservative leader. I didn't know the Lib Dems. I didn't know played, even though I had some concept of them. So to explain, in Wales specific, uh, there are five parties that can win seats in the Senate or the uh, what used to be called the, the the assembly, and in some cases, gets called the Welsh Parliament, um, but pretty much everybody else calls it the Senate. I've never heard it called the Welsh Parliament, except for by the Conservative government when they decide to change the name. Uh, nonetheless, there are five parties that do or can get elected. I guess I should put it that way. Those parties are the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, as you might imagine, the Plaid Cymru, which is the uh, Independence Party for Wales. Uh, in English, it translates as the Party of Wales, which I think is kind of straightforward. Uh, and you have the Liberal Democrats, or Lib Dems, as they often get referred to. And you have the now-called Reform, once upon a time called UKIP. Uh, they've kind of morphed into different parties under different ideas, but pretty much, especially lately, the same leader. Uh, so they're very much a certain political viewpoint. So 
Again, not going to go into political discussions. Uh, there are places to go for that. I don't think you should listen to me as an outsider on my political opinion in the UK. Um, if you listen to my podcast, you probably got an idea of at least some of my thoughts because it does come through in, in when we talk about history of Wales. But that doesn't mean that that uh, that you should listen to me for a vote. So, But I think it's important to know that you do have the right to vote. Those are the parties you're probably going to be choosing from. And importantly, that as it is your right to vote and as it does affect you living in the country, I think it's important to vote. I think we're lucky in the fact that in these democracies that we live in, there is this understanding about how things work, how people are elected, and each section has different ways of voting. Uh, in the UK, obviously, there's the main first-past-the-post system. In other words, you're voting for the local candidate who then has a leader, and the leader, if they get enough seats, becomes the prime minister, uh, as it works in every British parliamentary system in the world, which is different from America and different from other places where they have separate votes for leadership. Uh, you have the Senate election, which is slightly different because you don't have necessarily a first-past-the-post system. You have a mixed uh, mixed proportional vote. And without getting deep in the weeds of the politics of it, effectively you're voting for... You might vote for a local candidate, but you're also going to vote for a party, and the party then pulls off a list of people that they've selected to be the elected representative, and they do it by... And the way the Senate seats are proportioned outside of the local candidate is the the percentage of popular vote. So depending on how high you got in the popular vote determines on how many seats you get. Typically, well, not typically, traditionally, it has meant that the Labour Party has won every single election, be it with a majority or a minority government, which if you don't understand the British system, the minority government means that the government who wins doesn't win 50% of the seats plus one. So in other words, they can't just vote in something on their own. They usually need either another party or at least a few members of the Senate to vote with them in order to win. So that's something that, that is a derivative of the British system. So if you, you know, like Canada has this, a lot of other commonwealths have this same setup and same system. Again, very different than the United States where it's a totally different situation because you don't win or lose. There's no such thing as a, as a, a vote that could pull down the government like a non-confidence vote in, the, uh, in a British parliamentary system. You don't have a function of that in the American system because you don't vote for your president as leader of a party. He's voted as or she is voted as president. So in that perspective, you have a very different kind of environment and atmosphere than you have in the British parliamentary system. So that kind of gives you an overview of how they work. And, and certainly the Senate is a little bit more complex because of the way the voting system works than it is for, say, the British parliamentary system, which is all based on first past the post. If you get the most votes, the MP uh, candidate, I guess I should clarify, gets the most votes. It doesn't matter by what percentage vote they get they win the seat regardless it's a winner take all sort of thing which is very similar to canada and the united states who do that and i i know australia is different and unfortunately i don't know enough about it to speak about how their system works because i know they have slightly different things but i i haven't studied it enough to know so i apologize same thing with new zealand and, and a lot of the other countries in the world i just haven't spent time researching their politics to kind of know how their votes work but some of them have proportional representation so that instead of voting for local candidates you're strictly voting on on which party you believe should make government which then leads to so many seats being issued to that that party and all of that then leads to how and why did i as a canadian citizen get to vote in a uk election well it, as I've said earlier, it starts because you're you're there on a non-visitor visa. So you're there on a long-term visa, usually a working visa of some type. In my case, it's it was and still could be as a UK ancestry resident because my grandparents came from Wales. I can 
go back to Wales on the justification I can find a job, and as long as I support myself without relying on the government for funding, I'm able to go over pretty much any time I want and get into the UK. At least in the past two times I've done this, it's not exactly been complicated or difficult, certainly a lot easier than if you came the other direction. I know from friends of mine who've tried to come to Canada, it is not an easy process, and America being similar. So in that respect, it gives me a bit of an advantage. And then I can go over for about four to five years, depending on which year we're talking about, because the visas have changed over the years. And at the end of that, if I decide to, I can try and take up permanent residency, leading eventually to citizenship. That is and was my initial goal for going over in the first place. So, yeah. So with that in mind, with the thought process that I was going to live there for as my forever home the first time I went over, then it felt right to vote in the elections because they did affect me. I was a taxpayer. I paid quite a bit of taxes to the government. So I felt like because of that, I had a right to hold an opinion on that. In fact, I didn't vote in Canadian elections strictly because of that, because living in the UK, I wasn't following what was going on in Canada, and it didn't seem right to vote in an election I didn't know anything about. So for me, I actually traded places I was voting in. So we would vote in the Senate elections, then called the Assembly elections, and we voted in the um, in the national election. i sure we voted in council elections, but I can't remember when or if we did. Um, we were only there four years, so I can't honestly tell you whether we did or not, because towards the end, when the next election came up, we were getting close to leaving, and I was kind of like, well, again, felt uncomfortable voting in something when I wasn't sticking around. So for me, that's kind of the way I looked at it. Other people might have different opinions, but I, and I think if you're a British citizen, I'm not sure you're comfortable with hearing this, but I think it's... It's a, it's a holdover from the imperial days. That's what it is. It's the British Empire. You know, we used to all be citizens of the British Empire first, and then citizens of our country second. So that's kind of much like the Commonwealth. It's, it's something of a holdover from those days, and it kind of sticks around because of that. And in some respects, as a as citizen of Canada who, who has lived in the UK, I appreciate that because I feel like my well both sides of my family came from the UK that's where they originated as I proved in the DNA episode a couple of weeks ago and uh, the fact of the matter is is that for me that's still a place that I call home even if I'm not living there so I do consider it important to when I am there to participate and to be informed on what's going on and again that's one side of it. Now, the other side of it, which I found equally interesting, equally fascinating, and equally befuddling and confusing, was I ended up... So, initially, I, w I didn't know who to vote for. That's long and the short of it was. Is I didn't have a clue what the party stood for, which platform I agreed with. I knew they were different in, than in Canada, where the platforms would be slightly tilted a different way i don't know how to describe it better than that but but i've always i've always said if 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 american politics starts on the right canadian politics starts sort of in the middle and then the british politics is sort of farther to the left that's my own perspective on it, it doesn't mean you know your mileage may vary and you may look at me like i'm crazy but that's kind of how i've always sort of looked at it based on the fact that i kind of always saw it as sort of like the Democratic Party largely could fit into the envelope of the Canadian Conservative Party, and the Canadian Liberal Party could fit into the envelope of the UK Conservative Party, because while they are different parties with different political ideas, there's enough similarities that you can kind of see where they go. That's why I describe it that way. But again, that's my own personal perspective, and certainly by no means accurate. It's, it's a perspective is all. But... The interesting side effect of that is, is so I didn't really have an opinion. I, I like I said, I knew who Tony Blair was. I came over before because I, I came over in '99, so it was still in the height of his popularity. Shortly after the election, the two years prior, at the time the British economy was booming, and uh, it was part of the reason why I went over. Is I had talked to a recruiter who basically said, "Come over, they'll get a job for you, no problem." And he wasn't wrong. They 
within two months of me getting there, well, it seemed like it took forever. I had a job and four months after I arrived, I was in my permanent position in Cardiff and it was a very quick and easy transition, I would argue. So from the perspective of a lot of other things that I've done in my life, it was fairly quick and easy. From that standpoint of it, that's all I knew. I knew the economy was good. I knew Tony Blair was the leader and the Labour Party was in government and they were kind of a little bit like the Conservative Party, but not really. And the Conservative Party was a little bit different again. And the Liberal Democrats were different again. And everybody sort of didn't talk about Plaid Cymru at that point, especially in Cardiff. So I didn't really hear a lot about it. I had a friend who, who worked for the Lib Dems. I had another friend who worked for Labour. Um, I didn't know any Conservatives because this is Cardiff. <laughs> Um, if you know anything about that, that's the, they're just not that popular in, in that area. So it was kind of interesting. So I took those little, you know, those online things that you fill out where it's like, do you agree with this process? Who would you vote for? Who would you do it? And you run through all the little quizzes and at the end they say, well, you probably would support this this party. So I did that trying to figure out, right? I was trying to understand who I would vote for, or who I kind of stood with, and I went through all the processes. And I'm not going to talk about who it was that I ended up voting for, but the funny part of it was is I ended up going, okay, well, if I'm going to vote for these guys, and I've been in Canada, and I've been involved in politics in Canada for a long time at that point. I'd been involved in a couple of federal and provincial campaigns. I had supported various MPs and, and members of our legislature, and had worked for candidates across a different variety of parties. So I kind of wanted to get involved so I could kind of understand better sort of the inner workings of how party politics worked. How was it different than Canada, which my goodness, was it ever different? And how much did that reflect on kind of our perspective of these various places and things? And so I went into it with kind of an open mind and an open idea that okay well i'll i'll see what this party's like and and this one that it had chosen for me and i started to kind of get involved a little bit and i found out that they had these meetings and i went to the meeting and they had this stuff where they were like we're looking for volunteers to work at the da, 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 da. so i was like okay cool i'll do that sure so they sent me to a poll uh to uh like a like a, a area where people come to vote basically so in canada we call it polling um, I don't know what it's called in the UK. I'm sure it has a different name because they always seem to, but, but, uh, I can only remember the Canadian version at this time. So anyway, I got sent to this poll. So all I was doing, which I found very weird, very weird. And again, this goes back to the differences between Canada and the UK and the U S to be fair, because I had some friends in the U S from various parties and knew a little bit about how the American election systems worked, how candidates worked, how, functionality of things from the early 90s and early 2000s kind of worked out and so it was a long time ago long time ago i went to this poll and i sat there with this sheet of paper with a list of i can't remember if it was names or numbers i think it was names uh or possibly numbers it might have been numbers i i honest to goodness i don't remember this was ages ago this is 20 years ago now but i had this paper People would walk up, I would ask them, I think, yeah, I think it was number. I was like, what number are you? And they would give me their number and they'd walk off. And I found it so strange because I was like, so basically what you're telling me is, is I'm getting all these people's identities. It just felt really weird, but it was, it was one of those funny things. So like, whereas, so to compare, so in a Canadian system with this kind of thing, so what you're doing is, in the Canadian description, it's scrutinizing. So you're, you're basically making sure that the vote is fair and that there's no chicanery going on or, you know, underhandedness. So you're watching the vote. You're making sure everybody's being given the vote or the ballots that they're being able to do them in private and then hide their vote and then put it into the box, which would then not be opened until the end of the, you know, till the deadline. And then they're opened up all at once and everything's counted and now you don't know who's who obviously so that's kind of the canadian system and the way it generally works even today they still do everything by paper it's not really changed a whole lot like now the only difference is you do have to show id 
uh, when you come in. So for me, that was kind of the first introduction to this idea that you would identify who you were. And it threw me off because I don't remember that happening in the Canada to that point. It's all changed over the years. So now I'd be much more familiar. But at the time, it was very strange. And so you would go in, you would identify who you are effectively through this number. But you weren't identifying who you were to an official. You were identifying who you were to a party person, which that was the part that I think threw me off. I think that's the major difference. So that threw me off. So anyway, so they would go through. And the funny part of this all was, so... So at the time, again, I don't know if it's changed. I only ever did this once. I never did it again because I was like, eh. I stopped being interested in that party as well because after a while I was like, mm, I'm not sure I agree with you guys. But I, everybody wears colored ribbons to, der to derive whose party they're representing, right? So I'm wearing this ribbon. And never, so all these people are coming up knowing very well who, who I'm supporting or representing, I guess is the right word. And they kept coming up and saying, I'm not voting for your guy. <laughs> Just like, I don't care. I don't care who you're voting for. Go ahead. But it was so hilarious because people went out of their way to tell me they're not voting for your dude. And uh, to me, that was just it was at the time it was hilarious because I was like, I'm not a converted anything. I'm just a, I'm just doing this to see how this works, to kind of learn a bit more. Um, so it was kind of funny, but you know, it's one of those things you do as you are trying to understand something. So it wasn't like anybody was mean or harsh or anything. It was fine. People were just mostly jokey. Uh, I was there during the day and it was, it was mostly older people who were voting. So they were generally f fine, but they were very much, uh, to use a very, uh, British slang term, taking the mick out of me at every chance they had, uh, it seemed funny to me because I thought, I wonder what they would think with my accent, whether that would like, who's this American? But yeah, that was very interesting to kind of, to be a part of. And I have maintained an interest in, in at least the Welsh political system. I haven't, I don't care so much about the British system in total now, but I have maintained an interest and I do follow uh, a fair few of the Welsh political podcasts and things that are out there. Because to me, that's still important to me. It's still important to me to know about. Um, they recently did a constitutional reform uh, discussion, which was going on throughout the country last year, which I actually found very fascinating. And I'm sure most of the public could have cared less about because it wasn't really affecting them on a daily basis. So it didn't have the same sort of interest level. Famously, somebody said, I think it was Davis, the the conservative leader, said that was for the anoraks, which basically means that's for the that's for the 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 academics, and it had nothing to do with most people. From my perspective, again, I I, I go back to to what I was saying though. I I don't have a great political position as far as which party. If I went back to Wales now and had to vote, I think I'd struggle once again to decide what party to vote for. I think the biggest issue for me is is that each party has good points and bad points, and the bad, with the exception of one or two, where they mostly just have bad points. Um, there, there, there's really bad points in some of them, but I think there's really bad points in all of them. But I think there's really good points in all of them as well. So it depends on what they're trying to accomplish, and that's can be difficult as a voter to decide because you're like, well, or conversely, and de definitely in this election, I've, I've noticed that a lot of it is very samey. Nobody wants to be too far one way or the other because then people will get mad. I think everybody's taking very safe positions because of that. And so there isn't really a lot of difference. So then it makes it more difficult because then you're like, well, okay, if I vote for this person or that person, is it really different? And again, I go back to the same thing. It's up to you how you want to vote. Make sure you're informed. Don't want to turn this into a propaganda piece about voting, but yeah, I think it's important to make sure you know which party at least matches most of your opinions. Because the reality of it is, is that they're not all going to match everything. So, you know. That's that's just the way I found it, even as someone who's worked inside of them on occasion. For me, I've still maintained an interest in a couple of different things. I still maintain a desire to be informed on some of it. And for me, the, the Senate is something I still have a lot of interest in. I remember when uh, 
dissolution was announced. And I remember I had a, a friend of mine who was working at uh, University of Aberystwyth and him and I exchanging emails at that point. And he was talking about how much positivity that came out of it for him and his family. And I remember that kind of sense of pride that some people had. And I get not everybody's going to have that. And I'm not suggesting that everybody should necessarily but i think it was it was one of those things that uh, stood out to me when i went to wales it was largely the reason i mean outside of the family reasons it was part of the reason why i wanted to go to wales over england for me and my family while england presented a possibility of having more opportunity i think i just felt the pull to go to wales and cardiff was a smaller ish city and I think it had a lot of promise at the time and that was one of the reasons why we moved there and uh, as it turned out got work there fairly quickly so for me it always drew me in to go there and always would even today I still would lean into going there before I go to a place like London or Bristol or Manchester or you know anywhere like that because at the end of the day my my interest is still there. My my concern is still there. Outside of anything else, I want Wales to continue to improve. I want Wales to get better and better economically. Not to get into a political discussion. That's not kind of what this is about. This is more about my own political experience in Wales and how that kind of molded my interest in and continued interest in what's going on over there. I still maintain my interest and probably always will and uh, i always encourage people to do that as i said i'm glad the election's over with as time of this release because it gives me the ability to talk about it without seeming like i'm sort of pushing an agenda um, but i think if you are a, a commonwealth citizen you're living in the uk be aware you can vote be aware that you have the right to vote and get informed um, so you can vote and you know, because some of these things matter to you too. But all of that said, thank you all for listening, watching, whatever you chose to view this or listen to this podcast. Thank you guys all. Next week we'll have a regular episode again. Thankfully I'm over the sickness that has been plaguing me the last few weeks. So thankfully that allows me to get back to doing the usual. So until then, everyone take care. Have yourselves a great day. And uh, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, you can always reach me at welshhistorypodcast at gmail.com. You can call out my election opinions if you'd like. I don't know what if I've hopefully have I avoided saying anything about any party uh, other than I'm sure you can figure out which one I don't like. Um, because that's not kind of the point of this podcast episode, and nor would, do I ever want to give off that idea. I think people need to make their own choices. So obviously I'm not going to sit there and go, oh, by the way, I voted for so-and-so. Um, because in all honesty, about a year later, I went, maybe I shouldn't have voted for so-and-so. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> we all have our, our, our points of reference when it comes to regret. Um, but with all that, thank you, everybody. You can always uh, catch up with me on social media at uh, Twitter or X, depending on which flavor you want to describe it as at Welsh History Pod on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And if you'd like to help out our podcast through helping to fund the research that we do do for the podcast, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash Welsh History. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Welsh History Podcast is a member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. To find more information on them, you can do so at evergreenpodcast.com. Thanks for listening.